Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Theories in Action, the Senior Exchange. Uh, in its seventh year, this is an opportunity for seniors to kind of come together from various fields and various disciplines to discuss common problems or common reflections about the work that they've done. Uh, so we are joined here by the um, Social Innovation, Storytelling, and Social Innovation Roundtable, and I'm going to hand it off to them. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming out so early in the morning. Um, so we are the Social Innovation Roundtable, and how we've sort of decided to format our discussion around our experiences is a more interactive approach. Um, so what we're going to do is we'll talk about our experiences in the field of social innovation for about the first 15 or 20 minutes, and feel free to ask any questions along the way. Um, and then following that, we have a little bit of a workshop prepared. Um, and what we'll do is, I guess we'll just start by going down the table and introducing ourselves. Should we start on this end? Awesome. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Brown. I'm a senior studying uh, business, entrepreneurship, and organizational studies, BO for short. Uh, and I am from Canton, Ohio. Uh, and I'm going to be talking a little bit later about uh, social innovation, like my journey, uh, specifically as it pertains to uh, creating resources and opportunities for first generation college students or those who are the first in their families to go to college. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stanley. I'm a senior. Uh, I study history and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so with Jess, I'm one of the co-founders of a venture called IVG, which is the Inter Ivy First Generation College Student Network. Um, and so I'm also going to be talking a little bit about um, our work with first gen <laughs> students um, and also sort of the role that personal narrative plays um, in political change. My name's Neha, I'm from Singapore, and um, my experience with social innovation is a little bit different. I wrote my senior thesis on intellectual property laws and social innovation and looked at what it meant to own an idea. So I'll be talking at a little bit about what I found. Hi everyone, I'm Fiora. I'm from Scotland. Um, I'm a senior studying English literature and I'll be talking about my experiences with the student language exchange and with um, encouraging cultural engagement on college campuses. Um, hey, I'm Kavya. I'm a senior. I was a social innovation fellow this past year and um, I did Seen and Heard. I launched a venture called Seen and Heard, which is, um, it was a pilot program targeted at homeless youth, which was um, aimed at civic engagement and community action. So I led a summer of um, like eight weeks of workshops that had to do with different themes and you'll get a little taste of that today in our workshops. So. Great, and I guess as we promised, we're just gonna go back down the table and talk a little <laughs> bit about um, our experiences and our stories in that realm from those snapshots that you just heard. So we'll start with maybe this end of the table this time. Okay. Um, by the way, I'm a public health major and pre-med, so <laughs> there's me. Uh, so seen and heard, um, it took a path kind of from when I I was a freshman, I, I'm from Chicago, and I had um, a lot of interest in the huge gun violence issue there and just youth, how they get wrapped up in violence in Chicago, but I didn't really know how, um, I didn't feel any control over this issue, I didn't feel like it was part of my realm, um, so I kind of approached social innovation and asked them, you know, what, where can I get involved here, and uh, the first step that I took was just going to Chicago, going to youth centers and asking them, you know, what what is it that you guys need? Where are the gaps in services? Um, how can I help? And so I did that for one semester and within the first two, three interviews that I had there, almost all of them were saying, um, the uh, directors of the organizations, two out of three of them, first thing they said was just, we have all, all these youth here who have so much to say and when people hear them speak they they change their minds completely and they change policies and we've taken them to Springfield on these trips um, th these are homeless youth I'm talking about by the way at the youth centers and um, when they go to the on these trips like they've seen such an impact made but there's no uh, training around that and there's no way to really capture these stories and put them somewhere um, and a lot of the youth just don't have experience in this and they feel really intimidated going in front of a bunch of people and telling their story. So um, she said it would be amazing if you could run some kind of civic engagement program. It's a 
huge growing field amongst young people especially. Um, so I looked into something called Mikva Challenge, which is a civic engagement program for high schoolers in Chicago. And they do something similar, um, but for people who are in school. And the population I was working with is a lot of them have dropped out of high school. A lot of them don't have experience the education level that people do in Mikva Challenge, so it's just not accessible to them. So I basically took their year-long school curriculum program and broke it down into an eight-week pilot for these homeless youth that was just more relatable to their experience. Um, it was a lot more flexible so that they had an opportunity to speak rather than me speaking at them or me trying to get something specific out of them. It was very open-ended kind of. And um, yeah, I did that for eight weeks. So it was really tough because this was meant for a year long program. Um, but I videotaped some of their reactions at the end of it. And uh, it, it was a really cool experience. And they really loved it. We didn't get um, to continue the program after I left because I was here. And it was, I think, really hard to when they have so many other priorities at the youth center, um, if someone's not there, like really putting the program in place, they just don't have extra funding to hire someone to keep it going. So it's something that I'm gonna be in Chicago this summer that maybe I'll try again. But um, yeah, for now, like I, I have this amazing experience from last summer that's uh, kind of built into why I think storytelling is just so important and why it's, played a big role in how I speak after social innovation. Um, I, I, the story Sparks, for example, Spark Story, what's it called? Swear <laughs> yeah, Story of Sparks. Um, listen to like all the little podcasts on there and they're super cool. And I think it's just like this expanding field right now of so many people have th things to say, how do we capture that? Um, and I didn't really realize that, that that's even what I was doing at the time until afterwards when this idea of narratives and social innovation became like a title. And so I'm really glad to be part of this. Um, but yeah, that's all I have from my experience. <laughs> cool. Um, great. So as Kavya talked about, our, our topic is narratives and social innovation. And I actually have notes today, which is weird because I don't usually bring notes when I talk about what I do because we talk about it all the time. So <laughs> not really much need for notes. But I think um, recently I've been thinking a lot about why we do what we do. Um, and it's something that Lizzie and Alan stress a lot, constantly rethinking what the purpose of your venture is, why it's important and who it's important to. Um, so a lot of this stuff I'm not too comfortable talking about. So forgive me if I'm like stumbling I'm like still coming to grips with it after four years um, okay so who in this room including you guys mm -hmm. <laughs> has ever learned French Spanish German or Italian okay who in this room has ever learned Javanese Landa Telugu Bengali Marathi or Tamil oh well done. That's <laughs> unusual. <laughs> um, so all of those languages are in the top 20 most spoken languages in the world. And before I started with Esli, I had absolutely no idea that they even existed. Um, so the Student Language Exchange trains students who speak languages that aren't usually offered on college campuses to share those languages with their peers. Um, and we kind of use language as a tool for measuring cultural engagement. So the idea is that if people are usually engaging with European languages, they're usually going to be engaging with European cultures. Um, if they're engaging with some of the languages that are very widely spoken but not usually offered, that's uh, shifting their perspective, shifting their paradigms, um, and allowing them to globalize in a way that's truly representative of what the world's cultures look like. So. We usually talk about this in a way that says <coughs> it's important to build empathy in students. Um, it's important to allow international students or students from diverse backgrounds to bring their culture to the fore, to have a platform to speak about their experiences. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we usually say that it gives American students who can't maybe afford to study abroad or who haven't had a lot of um, opportunities to engage in language learning an opportunity to do so with their peers um, in a very accessible way. And we also say that it celebrates diversity in our communities. So all of those things are true, and I still very much believe them. But I think recently my story has, the way that I tell this story has kind of changed a little because I've been thinking 
a lot about conversations that we have on campus around privilege, around systems of oppression, around um, ways that uh, privilege it, ways that privilege manifests itself subtly in that aren't apparent in everyday circumstances. So I think part of what we do too is making sure that Americans and people from the English speaking world, myself included, I'm from the UK, are aware of their privilege and know how to navigate that in the wider world. And that's important on a university level because um, so firstly, the students that we're working with are probably going to be working for multinational corporations, they're going to be working for government, they're going to be in places where they have a lot of power to move in the world, and it's really important that they know what, how uh, America as a country, as a passport, and as an identity um, is able to enact power on other countries and has done so historically. Um, it's also important because there is an international population on this campus and on many campuses across the US. And that international population often intersects with other um, categories of identity such as race or um, language, language learning. So you often have people who don't speak English as a first language who are in the classroom with you and it's really important that they know that their perspective is going to be heard, that it's going to be utilized in a way that um, brings them into discussion and doesn't invalidate their experiences. I think it's also important because immigration is such a hot topic these days and so if we're not aware of the cultural balances working within our education system, um, we're also not aware of how they work on a national level and what it means to be in this country and not have a passport. Um, and then I think, I think the last thing is that it's important for universities as institutions to understand how their privilege to decide which cultures are uh, seen on their campus, um, how they might have that privilege and how they might use it in a way that uh, brings underrepresented voices to the fore, especially as we have universities pushing to globalize over a period of the last 10 years, the amount of international students has more than doubled in the US. Um, so when they're doing that, what sort of students are they representing? And, and when they, those students get to campus, what sort of campus environment are they, are they um, approaching? So those are kind of like the changes in the way that I talk about SLE and the way that I talk about um, the story of the student language exchange. And I just wanted to um, point to that shift because I think at this stage when we're just about to graduate, it kind of becomes like our narratives are set in stone. Um, so it's nice to be thinking that actually they continue to evolve and our work in social innovation will continue to evolve as we move on from brand two. For me, I've never been a social innovator, so to speak. I haven't really started anything, um, but I've always been fascinated by this process of social innovation and what it <clears throat> means to innovate and why people innovate, um, why they choose to do what they do. Um, and my senior thesis was a really, really fun project for me, actually, because I got to interview a bunch of social entrepreneurs um, at every stage of development, from the early stages to extremely experienced um, late stage social, social entrepreneurs and talk to them about their ideas, their narratives, their processes, and um, how they think about what they would like to protect about their venture and what they would like to share, um, which was a more important question than I originally thought it was. Um, and it was really interesting to see how entrepreneurs at different stages of development actually thought about that. Um, and something that was very common about uh, late stage social entrepreneurs was they looked at intellectual property protections, um, which are generally used in the for-profit world as a money-making kind of protection. In the social innovation realm, it seemed to be used as more of a protection for populations. It was more of like a, a safety concern, if anything. Um, if an innovation was replicated in a way that was wrong, innovators voiced a concern about their populations and how they would be affected by the work that was being done, um, which was very interesting to see. Whereas early stage social entrepreneurs seem to look at these protections as a way to share, um, which again isn't a, a typical way of thinking about things, to think about a protection as a sharing mechanism, um, but they use these licenses in a way to start a conversation around um, their issue and what they would like to solve and spark collaboration in the sector. 
Um, so in the future, I think like this is an area that warrants a lot more study because these protections could have a really valuable place in the realm of social innovation for sharing narratives. Um, and it was really interesting to sort of see that. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself again. Um, so hi, my name is Stanley. Again, I'm a senior from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm a first generation college student. I'm a queer student. I'm a black student. Um, I identify as a low income student. Um, and so the reason I reintroduced myself is because um, I think in a lot of times in these settings, but also in life in general, we introduce ourselves in sort of what feels like a socially acceptable way as opposed to maybe the ways that we feel most comfortable or the ways that we, um, in ways that feel meaningful for us. Um, and so I share those things because those are things that are meaningful for me. Um, and I'd like to do it in a little bit more empathetic way. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a first generation college student um, and the venture that myself and Jessica and Manuel, who coordinated this entire thing, worked on was IVG. Um, and so from the very start, this was always something that was um, intensely personal work. Um, so it's definitely possible to do work in a population that you don't identify with, um, but that wasn't the case for us. Um, the reason that we were doing the work that we were doing um, is because we were first generation college students ourselves. It's because we had felt the tensions um, in trying to navigate a system and and feeling really lonely or feeling really um, upset or hurt and wanting to do something about that, but not necessarily knowing how. Um, so sort of what I want to talk about today is around um, honesty and the place that I think that I ha that has in storytelling and social change. Um, so like I mentioned, this work is in incredibly personal for me. Um, and what that meant was when this work first started, um, you know, in trying to communicate with people, they ask, you know, what is a first generation college student? What does that mean? Um, why is this important? Um, those sorts of questions. And so it almost sort of necessitates a personal sharing. Um, and so for me, that was really difficult because I'm like naturally a very private person. This is a thing that I care a lot about, um, but it requires me to share uh, sort of my personal experiences. Um, and so with that, I guess the risk that that ran really early on was um, being unaccustomed to talking about my own personal experiences. Um, I got really uncomfortable really early on in a lot of, in talking to um, potential funders and talking to newspapers and talking to just regular other students, um, you know, whether they were first-gen students or not around my story and what it meant to be a first-gen student and a lot of, I guess, uncomfortability around sharing too much. And so when I'm telling my story on what it means to be a first-gen college student, do I say, um, you know, I went to, uh, you know, terrible high school in Atlanta and, you know, we started off with 600 kids and 100 kids made it to graduation. Um, you know, what is the impact that that has on the room of people that I'm talking to? Um, you know, do I share that my mom passed away when I was young and so, um, you know, my aunt took care of us, um, you know, and what weight does that have in the room? Um, or, you know, does that become intentional? And so I think the thing that I started thinking about um, in storytelling and in particular when you're sort of telling personal narratives that have a potential to have political change, one of the things I sort of realized two things, one being thinking a lot about the role that honesty played in these stories. Um, and so when I thought back to what really motivated me to do this work and what you know inspired me to be able to speak out in general um, on these issues, I thought about the upperclassmen and the seniors who had come before me and the ways that they had um, been brave and bold in sharing their stories um, and in the level of honesty that they displayed. Um, and so it was in those moments of uncomfortability, I'm sure for them at least, you know, when they took the chance to become more vulnerable, um, they also became more empathetic. They also became more relatable. They also became more human. Um, and that that had an impact on people. Um, and so that sort of inspired me to, in my work, um, want to be as open as possible to learn how to share the most vulnerable parts of myself in this work, um, but also to figure out how to do that strategically and how to do that in a way that feels um, honest for myself and the things that I want to share, um, but
but also in a way that you know can sort of lead to social change. Um, so, as I sort of mentioned, honesty and sharing your own story is both personal and political. But I think the sort of general theme that I've gotten out of this work after now doing this for two and a half years and talking about myself in front of strange, a crowd full of strangers most of the time, um, is that honesty can move people um, and your story can move people, but your story is always your own. Um, and in any kind of work that you do, whether that be social change work or whether it be in your day-to-day -day life and relationships, um, to understand the power of vulnerability, to understand the power of honesty, um, but also to understand your audience, to understand um, who you feel comfortable sharing with, um, and to understand the kind of impact that that'll have on people. Um, and so for me, now what that looks like is, in particular, I've realized that when I'm in a room full of other first-gen students, um, in particular like underclassmen students, or maybe um, in particular like rooms full of strangers, but who are first-gen, who I know might have some basis of understanding what I mean, um, those are the moments where I tend to take more risk um, and to share a little bit more and to be a little bit more vulnerable um, because I recognize the impact that that had on me. Um, and I'm still learning and still I'm still in the process of understanding what it means to do that in more public ways with people who may not understand exactly where I'm coming from, who may be um, questioning at best or um, vilifying at worst, which has happened. Um, and so I think for me, in, in those spaces, learning how to tell a powerful story that's also honest. Um, and so the last thing I'll say is um, I was talking with Manny and Jess um, a while ago, and we were talking about how being first gen, to be you know one of the first people in your family to go to Brown, which is this sort of like bastion of privilege and elitism and you know elite society, can feel really contradictory. Um, and in a lot of ways, you can sort of start to think of yourself as this contradiction being here. You know, I'm a low income student. I come from this neighborhood. I come from this background, um, and I'm in this very different kind of place. Um, I always tell the story of when I first got here, I just like spent three months looking at the grass and like just like walking around campus with my mouth open because like the grass was so green and that was so unusual and it was just like, wow, look at this expensive grass, like this place is just really intense. Um, but I've, I've, I've come to learn that, in, at least in thinking about myself and my own story, that um, even though being here feels contradictory at times, that like that's a feeling, right, that I am not a contradiction. Um, being here as a first-gen low-income student, as a queer student, as a black student, um, all of these things can feel very difficult at times, um, but these are the result, you know, these are the results of sort of structural inequalities in society that make it difficult for folks who look like me, who've experienced the things that I've experienced to be in places like this and to be in places like this fully, but that, that doesn't mean that I'm a contradiction because I'm myself, I can't be contradictory. Um, <laughs> So I think that's all I got to share um, around honesty and storytelling. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jessica Brown. Uh, not uh, but Jessica Brown, but actually Jessica Brown. Uh, and uh, I was thinking through what I was going to talk about, and I thought uh, maybe some of the best ways uh, to get across storytelling was to lead by example, um, which everybody else has also done. Uh, so I'm going to tell a story that I've only ever told once, actually, in uh, a class, a specific class called Leading Social Ventures. Uh, and uh, we were practicing storytelling and we were practicing how to communicate why our ventures uh, meant so much to us. Uh, and I thought a lot about freshman year. I thought a lot about my experiences and where those experiences took place. Uh, and I don't like to stand, I don't like to walk, so lots of times I'm sitting. Um, so a lot of my important experiences happened on a series of different couches. Uh, and I remember thinking and associating these different couches uh, to different points in my brown experience. I remember um, sitting on a blue couch um, in Jamison Lounge 
Um, I remember being there at 2 a.m. with a bunch of friends um, doing struggle study sessions, as we like to call them, really late at night where it was a mixture of half, half, um, half studying, half watching a bunch of wild YouTube videos, half singing the latest Beyonce album, which still happens, um, and reading a string of texts from my mom that had gone unanswered. Um, reading things from my family like why aren't you responding like why aren't you like staying in connection with us um, and feeling really sad that I had um, but and really happy that I had found a family away from my family and like didn't have to like constantly be engaging and constantly be remembering what I had, had left behind because it was so easy to not think about those in those moments um, I remember sitting on a red couch um, the first time I had failed a class. Um, I remember sitting there feeling as if this was proof that I didn't belong here, feeling as if, oh, this is, <laughs> this is a testament to how underprepared I was for Brown, having come from a high school that didn't give exams <laughs> or having come from experiences where I didn't know how to study or I was so independent that I didn't ever ask for help or I didn't need help and even when teachers at Brown told me to go seek tutoring, seek that. I was like, what do you mean? I'm Jessica Brown. Um, I don't need any of those resources. I can do this on my own. Um, and I remember sitting there remembering how wrong I was and just crying over and over again. And again, not reaching out um, to, to folks or family members to express uh, what I was feeling or what I was going through. Um, I still actually don't think <laughs> anyone in my family knows how often I've failed here because um, it's just something so hard for me um, to express. Um, I remember later <laughs> after winter break, um, I remember getting together again um, and sitting on a green couch um, in the BCSC formerly known as the Third World Center. Um, and I remember feeling so much support. I remember some of the first conversations that our friends had connecting the dots that like, oh wow, we all came together. We all just happened to be talking about very similar experiences. Why is that? I remember <laughs> someone first saying the word first gen. I remember, remember folks first saying the word swear center and like making a lot of connections between one, who we are, and two, how we can make changes and how we can do this work to support ourselves. Um, and when I think about how alone I felt on the first two couches and then how supported I felt it when I found people that I could talk to these things about, when I found folks that were willing to do this work with me and willing to engage in these hard stories, engage in like the true honesty that it meant for us to make any sort of substantive change and make our experiences better. Um, I think a lot about what IVG means to me um, and how at the heart of it, um, yeah, I want institutional change and I want things to be torn down a lot of the times and I'm very angry, but I really want IVG to just be a couch. I want it to be a place where folks can sit and folks can unload and people can share their experiences and they don't have to feel alone and they can be supported and they can be comforted and they can sleep if they want, I don't know. Um, but I really want, at the heart of it, I want it to be kind of that, that landing ground um, for students to know that they're not alone, they don't have to go through this alone um, and they can be supported through a network of other people um, that have been through that. Uh, and I hope that it's becoming that and I think in the future, that's that's basically the beginning. And if if other structural changes come from that, uh, that's beautiful, and they already have. Um, but I really just don't want anyone to feel as alone or isolated or have to go through some of those experiences of failure um, and connection by themselves. So, yeah, that's my story. <coughs> Where are we <laughs> <laughs> Got lost in that story for a second. <laughs> um, so this is the part where we transition to a more interactive component. Um, and 
Yes. Should we do questions do before? Questions? Sure. Yeah. We can do questions now, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, holding off on interaction for a minute. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions for any? All right. Yes. Have you ever found yourself feeling like you're lying through a story or lying or like what I mean are like you tell a story that like is really good and it resonates with people but you feel apprehensive or like there's a, an issue there you cross some kind of like moral line that no one else can see except for you has that ever happened I and mean, how does that feel yes I, I used to tell this story about my grandmother um I don't know this is how the story starts. I don't know if you've been to Scotland, but people in Scotland are really, really hard to understand, even if you're Scottish. Mm. Um, <laughs> and it's true, like, they speak a dialect, essentially, not, not um, like, standard written English. Um, and as I sort of moved away and took opportunities, I went to a United World College where I was with people from all over the world and I couldn't really speak with my home accent, otherwise it just was, like, incomprehensible. Um, I went home and... I guess kind of similar to what Jess is saying, my family were like, why are you not staying in touch? And one of the really big markers of that, I mean, you can hear now I don't speak with a Scottish accent anymore. Um, and so it got to the point where my grandmother and I couldn't understand each other. Like it just, the conversation couldn't happen. But I feel like that's dishonest because there are other factors involved in our separation. It's not just a language thing. Mm. Um, and also because equating dialects or equating different cultures within the same country to l very, very different modes of communication, it, like that just doesn't ring true for me. Um, but that's kind of like my story of why I came to this work, even if it doesn't actually connect. So I had to like step back and rethink about why I was telling that. Yeah, I also think um, there's there's a difficulty, I think, again, with a lot of what Stanley was talking about, <coughs> and, like honesty and um, in what ways uh, a story can be used or strategic. And I think thinking about your life as something that can be strategic is something that, I mean, for me personally, uh, has been extraordinarily like a painful thing to work through um thinking about okay like <laughs> which unfortunate experience like will i will i share in order to like um get support get someone to like understand um where i'm coming from and i think not just that process but the process of telling a story over and over again it begins it can sometimes begin to feel um very detached from reality and really hard to like ground uh, yourself back in um, the experience or back in kind of like the truth of why um, you're going you're exploring social innovation or any sort of um, release as an avenue so I think yeah it's similar uh, to what Fiora was saying really always <coughs> taking moments to re-examine and reassess why am I telling this story um, what does it mean to me and what like regrounding yourselves even in if some of the experiences are painful really re-emerging into those experiences and understanding why it is that um kind of those are your those are your base for understanding the work that you're doing um i also think uh already telling your own story is such a hard thing like what mm. parts of it are you picking out um, I ran into a lot of like walking a fine line between I'm I'm already trying to tell someone else's story and I don't identify with that population so that makes it like 10 times harder because I at any moment am I crossing a line by like telling someone else's story do they want it heard in certain places and they're not always there to, like tell me if that's okay or not so it's kind of a judgment call and then also you just worry like especially with super stigmatized populations you don't want the story that you choose to be the only thing that the the audience takes about that population now. And um, so it's really hard to get an all-encompassing story that like not only makes people emotional and really can, gets them to connect with who you're working with 
not in that room. Like, they, they can't see who I'm working with, so I'm trying to make it very visual. But at the same time, like, that's not the full story, and you always have to give these, like, oh, but but don't take that as, like, this is everyone, or that this is everyone's story yet. This is just one thing I'm telling you to just capture your attention, and you just have to, like, make sh- always check yourself, and that's why, especially in the workshops I did, it was, like, I needed to make sure I was always focusing on the end goal of this is they're telling their own stories and not someone telling a story for them and in the end you're not trying you're trying to give them the power to change things themselves rather than it's not about me and it's not I only use their stories to spread the word about what we're doing and not to express their story if that makes any sense so that's just like another aspect of when you're trying to talk on behalf of other people Stanley listening to you talk maybe sort of really reflect on whether you felt that your desire to change things for others, and maybe you too, Jess, um, actually pushed you to a place of self-exploitation. Like, did you feel, like, like you used the word strategic, but I also wonder if you felt violated. Mm-hmm. Actually, I wrote that down on my little sheet of paper earlier. <laughs> it's it like <laughs> feeling stereotype exploited. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I would say at times, um, in particular, a moment where I was thinking about that um, was uh, about now, I guess it's a little, yeah, it's exactly a year ago. Jesus Christ, time flies, y'all. Um, <laughs> we had the first first gen conference here at Brown. Um, and so we like did like a couple interviews with like the New York Times, one of which I was a very prominent feature in. And so that was weird. Um, But what was more, the video was actually okay, but there was a story that accompanied it. Um, And so we were talking to this reporter um, and bless her heart, but she was asking, she was was trying to tell a story in a very honest way. Um, But it was the sort of thing where like, a question is suddenly put in front of you and you don't know if you should share so that for me it was like sort of at the end she was like just very casually like oh yeah so you like grew up low income and stuff right and I was like yeah like definitely okay yeah so your mom's on food stamps and all that stuff right and I'm like yes um and so that ended up being like one of the last things I got it printed printed in the article it was like Stanley whose mother uses food stamps um and so my mom didn't talk to me for two months after that um and so And I wasn't, it was also one of those things where even in my own personal life, it's, you know, who, who am I speaking on behalf of and how am I representing them? Because it's not also just about me. Um, but I am in this position where I'm, I'm talking for lots of other folks in my life. Um, and so I think for me, it's dependent on the person, um, and how genuine, um, they feel and sort of wanting to connect and truly sort of understand as opposed to, do I feel like a person is coming in? Um, with a very particular point of view and wants to sort of um, put me in a box and use me as a representative example for this thing, um, which was also a sort of issue that folks came up with. And I think why so many folks were uncomfortable. Um, I think they felt like, oh, like they want, you know, this particular story. They want this poor kid from the inner city who's working six jobs and about to break down. And can you share that with everyone? Um, Because it'll be so important and like they'll see and it'll be such an important thing. And to it's a really sort of, I think it starts to feel exploitative because um, at least in my own personal experience like with this work, like you do understand like that is actually what moves people. Um, you can tell them about a need, but people don't care until, like people wanna see those parts of yourself. They wanna see you at your worst. Mm-hmm. Um, and that I think has a really sort of intense impact like Jessica said earlier, because um, it gets to this point where, at least in this line of work, I can't speak for all other kinds of things, although I will say, um, I feel like this might apply for lots of other things where where people are doing identity-based work. Um, You have to sort of share the most difficult and intense parts of your lives over and over again in order for people to care, in order for resources to happen. And so then that's when the personal (laughs) negotiation happens on, um, you know, can I do this in a way that feels okay for me? And am I willing to share this? Am I willing to do this? Knowing that it can have this potential impact, um, whether that be um, an article, whether that be 
um, whether a president is going to support a center, whether that be this person is going to donate money, or whether or not that means this person who's really important is going to walk away and have a better understanding of what that means. And so if that means I have to, you know, feel really shitty for this next hour, like it's it's actually really important that this person has a great understanding. And so those are things we're negotiating, I think, every single day, depending on the person. But it's definitely a tension that does exist. I, building <coughs> off of that, I guess I'm interested in hearing your advice. Be, uh, um, for those of you who uh, are working on an issue that impacts your own community, however that's defined, what advice would you give to students who are doing similar work where they have to bridge that t or deal with that tension of, I know that by sharing my story, I'm creating connection and I'm creating, um, I'm creating resonance um, around the issue mm -hmm. and feeling uh, either of the pit, the potential pitfall of feeling exploited or just inauthentic in sharing those stories potentially over and over again or half truths that just make a point. Um, curious what advice you have for students who are, who are navigating those issues in the future. I don't really know if I don't know how to answer that necessarily but I think one thing is that I've been looking for context for things like when it before I speak on anything I always think about whether the audience has context for what I'm saying particularly if I'm speaking about someone else's story and I think something that I noticed from what Stanley is saying um, is that your story and the story of adventure is never only your own story um, and that's like I'm kind of okay with exploiting myself like that's my own <laughs> issue right but I'm not okay with exploiting my family or my community um, and so I think sometimes when those facts get taken out of context they become like that for me that's where the the tension comes in um, I don't know if that's an answer or not Okay, should we do some... Yeah, yeah I didn't, maybe just, yeah, thinking about having the conversations on how to tell a story in maybe any different various types of situations, I think, um, in our case specifically. Uh, press was a, a very um, poignant press and, like, administration were very... Uh, where a lot of the folks in which we were dealing with and which we were beginning to think about some of the impacts of story. Um, so, and I think we, we moved through that space and kind of examined consequences later. Um, so maybe, um, maybe mm -hmm. doing some of that work beforehand and thinking through mm -hmm. um, limits, thinking through, uh, yeah, kind of what, uh, where you want to go and like what are the reasons for for going there um because i think that that contributed to a lot of like my personal feelings of like oh i just don't want to be involved but i can't tell why and i wasn't able to explain why i didn't want to talk to people right. or why i didn't want to share stories um and i think yeah maybe having more time to think through and work through why that was would have gotten me to a place where i could have could have shared more um, in the ways in which I wanted to, in which I, in ways in which I felt I had agency over my own, um, my own experience. I think that's actually a really nice lead, <laughs> because one of the things we're gonna do with this activity is like a, a red light, green light. Um, what do you feel okay with sharing, and and what are you not okay with sharing? Mm. Um, start with the brainstorming yeah yeah um so now we're gonna lead into an interactive activity uh so i am going to help facilitate the first piece of it uh and i think a lot of our stories are similar in seeing a need seeing an issue and wanting to explore it more um so one thing we want to do is kind of uh, crowdsource from you all what are issues uh, that you see um, specifically at Brown, I believe, where we're going to oh. hone it in. Okay, so what are issues that you see uh, within the Brown community? 
uh, and from that point we're going to get more into um, ways in which we can tell stories about those issues and get to a place of uh, maybe possibly getting some solutions um, but I'm just doing the first part so um, <laughs> so um, I mean you know a couple of minutes and then maybe just popcorn style uh, we're gonna ask you all for the issues that you thought about um, so maybe a minute to think about it and give like an example or two oh yeah um, example yeah. Uh, <laughs> lack of diversity of faculty members <laughs> example. Um, another example is accessibility of buildings and resources um, for members with disabilities, uh, both physical and mental. So actually, maybe to make it easier, um, if you could find a person next to you and share what you're thinking about with them first, and then we'll do a share out to us, um, just so you can get practice talking about it. <laughs> Where does the um, red light, green light stuff fit into, like, do we do the Venn diagram stuff first, and then are you going to chime in with, like, what people want to share or once they, like, siphon themselves into the Okay, so I'm just going to, like, explain how the Venn diagram works and list each issue and just have them go on each side, and then should I ask for people to share why they may have chosen a side, or, like, do you want to take over that? Um, that's probably a good segue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Should I do all the issues and then segue to you then? I think even we could just pick one or two. Yeah. Okay. Two. Okay. Cool. It's also how to check the Um, I'll actually just forward you the email right now. And you can add all. I added all like ten <laughs> names. There are new ones that they sent us today, so I'm gonna email that to you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll email to you now. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so if everyone can bring it back <laughs> a little bit. Um, so uh, we, I guess we'll now just just share out some of the things that folks talked about. There's not a lot of us, so we'll be we'll get a nice list. Let's we'll start over here. I heard you talking. <laughs> <laughs> so you have thoughts. Tariq and I were talking about two things. Um, I was talking about like access to like mental health care in some ways. Um, and Tariq was talking, or Tariq, do you want to Yeah. Um, just <coughs> talking about uh, lack of empathy within sciences, especially if you're not one of the like kind of predominant <coughs> identities. If you're not one of the what? Like the predominant identities. <coughs> I'm just going off of that mental mental health resources <coughs> in STEM fields, mm -hmm. specifically. I just echo um, the example you gave about uh, disability and access to buildings, information, experiences on campus. Mm -hmm. Um, 
something that's coming to mind right now that I've always been like perplexed by is that we have like a writing center like that helps students with writing, but we don't really have like any centers to help students with like more of the STEMs background, like quantitative problem solving stuff. And it's always been weird to me why that isn't a thing. just one of the ones that they mentioned mm -hmm. we yeah. can so um, we're gonna segue into a little bit of a um, just to get you thinking more about how you relate to these issues mm -hmm. um, we're gonna do a little physical activity here <laughs> so uh, we can choose maybe um, ac uh, mental health resources and access to mental health resources I think this is a good one um, okay so this is called this is one of the uh, activities that I used in my workshop this summer um, to get the youth thinking about what um, ha how they if they haven't thought about these issues on a grander scale besides just how they deal with them every day that was the first step to thinking about systems and just systems change generally mm -hmm. um, so what we're gonna do is let's say um, that side, the left side of the room, from my perspective, is going to represent an area of control. So if you feel that you have control over a certain issue, you would sit on that side of the room or stand. Um, this side of the room is going to represent something you feel influence over. Um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Not influence. Control and influence are the same thing. Uh, <laughs> something you just care about. If you care intensely about something, if you're passionate about it, that's this side of the room. You're gonna stand in the middle of the two in the aisle if you feel both of them. So that's why it's kind of a Venn diagram because you can choose from three spots. Um, so an example uh, is for of concern um, and passion for something but not feeling influence over it would be stu being stuck in traffic. So this is something you really care about. I hate this traffic but I have no control over it right now. Um, something you have influence over but don't necessarily care about is um, improving your grades in chemistry. But <laughs> that was an example. I personally have concern over that. But <laughs> I don't know. That's one thing. If you don't care about your grades in chemistry but you have influence over it, that would be where you stand. And then the middle is um, if you have both of those things. So uh, if we're choosing just this one idea of resources and access to resources um, in terms of mental health issues on Brown's campus. If you guys could just think about it for a second and stand where you feel you identify most. Um, so that side, if you feel any control and influence over the issue, this side, if you care about it, the middle of both. <laughs> Do you guys want to see it? Yeah, yeah, we should yeah. go too. <laughs> this in the summer um, I found a lot of people went to there were some contentious issues but generally a lot of the young people will go to the um, to the control side of the room like they felt a lot of influence over it and or the middle where like they f feel passionate about it but they also feel control over it which was really interesting to me because um, a lot of the issues we were talking about were like homelessness poverty uh, police brutality and they would go into the control side of the room and I would ask like you know what just where are you coming from in this? And they would say um, very personal things like, um, you know, I, I know 
what times of the hour I should be out and what areas of the neighborhood I should be in to not be running into trouble with the police. And it was stuff like that that would bring blame to themselves and you could really see that come out in this kind of activity where people, um, you know, put, where, where they put control of an issue and it varies a lot by uh, population. So I think it's interesting in a population, um, in our setting that we all feel, feel very passionate about a lot of issues here, don't always feel like we have, can exact control over or have influence over. Um, we're gonna do one more of these and then we'll kind of go into the next step of the activity. Um, so let's choose, Hmm. Should we choose? Uh, Should we do the science? Yeah, yeah. One? So lack of empathy within, within science. Yeah. Um, so lack of empathy within science. Could who brought that up? Could you just give one more sentence about what you know? Expand on that a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, I guess from for me it was kind of difficult finding support um, from like faculty members or from teachers, um, especially if mm -hmm. I'm struggling because of like. I don't know, like experiences with racism or just like feeling like general like mental health or general depression for whatever reason um, and trying to like bring myself back into, uh, I guess, like a reasonable standing in the class. Okay. Um, cool. So just in thinking about how that relates to you, if you could do the same thing, that's the influence side. This is um, the caring side, concern side, and then the middle is both. storytelling in action, um, we're going to ask people to sort of wherever you are, if you feel comfortable, um, to sort of share why you are where you are, um, and we're going to challenge people to challenge by choice, so you don't have to do it, um, but you know, this is a kind of space to sort of push yourself if you'd like to, um, to share any kind of personal experiences that you might have with this issue, or um, why it's important to you, or you know, sort of why you think you're sort of positioned are where you are. And we're gonna give you some tools um, to sort of think about like how to do that. Um, Cause as you said earlier, it can be difficult. Um, so there's a sort of metric or system, it's called like red light, green light, um, yellow light. So a green light statement is something that you can say at all times without concern. So it might be something like, I have a sister, great. Um, yellow light is something that you have to pause for or think about for a second and sort of think about whether or not you wanna share it. So it could be, I have a sister and I haven't talked to her in over a year. Um, red light is obviously something that like, ooh, like you do not want to share or you only share it in very specific circumstances with very specific people. So that might be, I have a sister and when we were younger, um, we were experiencing homelessness or something like that. That might not be something you wanna always share. So that might be a useful metric in sort of thinking about your own experiences um, to like take a second and think about um, like, what am I about to say? Where does this fall? All that <coughs> stuff. So, I will start since <laughs> I talked first. <laughs> um, so, I am where I am um, because um, this is an issue I care a lot about. I'm not a science concentrator, but I did come into Brown declared computer science. Um, so, that's what I thought I was going to do. Um, so, I understand. I understand. It's, it's sort of very personal for me, but not as personal because I didn't do it. Um, oh wait, we have to share a personal experience. Okay, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna challenge myself. Um, so, when I came into Brown, I declared computer science. Um, I took CS15. It was the most typical class I've ever taken. Um, it, it is the only time I have cried at Brown because mm -hmm. it was December and I was like working on a project and I'd been in there for like 12 hours straight and I just couldn't get it right. And so I like left the side eye crying because I was like, oh my God, like I'm stupid. Like why can't I get this? Um, and then like dropped the class shortly thereafter. Um, and so I understand sort of, at least for me, I'm here because I, I didn't feel like I had a lot of influence on being able to change the culture around that class in particular, but I guess the sciences more generally for folks like me who had no prior exposure to it. Um, but also it's, it's also something that's extremely important to me. I 
can go. <laughs> I'm Jamel, physics uh, and Africana concentrator. Um, if, I guess to share a story that would illuminate maybe why I'm here over the side is uh, my first week at Brown, I was walking down the street and somebody uh, somebody asked me for directions or something and obviously I was like, I'm new here as well. <laughs> um, and they're like, oh great, like what are you studying? It was a group of guys, uh, Asian guys. Um, and they said, and I was like, I think I'm gonna major in physics. And then they looked at me and they were like, isn't this strange for people like you? And I was like, uh, maybe it is. <laughs> like I was, you know, young and pretty, pretty, uh, I hadn't thought through any of these issues critically, so I was just a little bit confused by the question. Uh, I mean, as I've grown, I understand what they were saying, but um, but that was like the moment when I when I was like, oh, man, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't really know. Um, and then as I continued, and people continued to respond to me as if there was something wrong with me, um, then I knew that that I needed to do something. <laughs> um, and then I started a lot of uh, activism. Or uh, organizing around that issue, so that's why I feel in between because I feel strongly about it, but I'm, um, I think I've been trying to be part of the solution. Share someone in the middle. <laughs> I feel like we have all of our specific yeah. reasons for being in a place that wasn't specified. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> say that in my time here I just kind of like was in a similar situation as that where like I kind of like coasted through and didn't really recognize um, myself and my own identity and like my own um, <laughs> I guess kind of like self-discovery until very recently um, and so like recognizing that like you know race has such an integral um, issue in like so many different spheres and including science um, <laughs> only now I've started to really recognize that and to be able to identify like the different ways that it can be changed but still like am not comfortable in kind of addressing that kind of change and um, yeah just like kind of uh, taking action I guess what year are you? I'm a senior <laughs> yeah I'm standing here um, because I think it varies a lot department to to department, some of the STEM departments are better about um, having support and just having representation from historically underrepresented groups um, in their concentrations, others not so much. Uh, and I think some departments are getting better at it, others not so much, so that's why I'm kind of in between. Uh, in a lot of my classes, I still don't see a lot of historically underrepresented groups. Um, I'm. I've taken a lot of applied math courses and do, I guess, STEM. I don't know, I think it's STEM, yeah. Um, I think the, again, I didn't think about these issues at all. I came in pre-med and I like kind of knew I wanted to do that and then started questioning why I was doing what I was doing and what, I don't know, people, uh, especially when you hear so much rhetoric about what pre-med classes are going to be like, just accept that that's how it should be like. Mm -hmm. um, orgo is going to be hard. People aren't nice. Um, you're going to cry and take it because that's what you have to do to be pre-med and become a doctor. That's just the time you have to put in. But um, I just didn't, that's not how people learn best. And, and I think the only times that I was able to actually express myself and anything beyond just here are my studies, here is what I want to do academically and with my career was actually with my um, female professors and I don't know if that was a personal thing that I just felt more comfortable with them or um, or if it was actually that they were trying to get me to open up more but um, I just felt this disconnect between I didn't have, I've had one female professor in the sciences in all my time here and um, I, it frustrated me that like we're supposed to take our stories and our experiences and our emotions out of our science classes. So um, 
shameless plug, this is what MAPS does, the Minority Association of Pre-Med Students. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's what I got involved with junior year, and I feel like some more control over the issue just because once you're in an institution or in a group that has some kind of name, someone wants to listen to you. And if you come together as a group and go to professors, go to health careers office and say, this is a real issue that we want changed, um, people will listen because they just don't, HCO just didn't even know this was an issue that people cared enough about and didn't know how to approach it because they didn't have minority or women in their faculty to address it. So um, that's why I just feel like there is some opportunity for change there. Um, and, and I've gotten involved with it, but it, it still has a long way to go, so. Well, so we have one minute left. So maybe, yeah. Hi guys. Um, so I'm from engineering and urban studies, and kind of like what you said, I think it really does matter um, by department. And I think I've been really involved in the engineering department in the sense of like for three years, it's kind of my life, and finally, like doing more urban, getting out of that space. But um, I've never heard once someone besides my friends, and they've been like awesome female talk about how, like, talk about the issues in the engineering department. Like we, I feel as though you have to be a specific type of person to succeed in this department. And the consequences that has towards like every part of yourself. And you know, that's kind of where mental health comes in and how to cope with that. But that conversation doesn't even exist. And you know, the few times I've brought it up to professors or department heads, it's, it's because that conversation doesn't exist, they, they don't even know what it is that I'm talking about. Um, and I know that a lot of the students don't really even think about how the department may be hurting them in a lot of ways. Um, so I don't, I don't even, like, the, there, are, there are no groups. The students themselves don't really talk about it. Um, and the professors are, I don't know, I think, like, very clueless um, because not only, like, there's a lack of diversity in this department for s in, in so many ways. Women, I've had one female professor. People of color, no. Um, or even, they're all academics. They're not even really pursuing industry. So it's just like the, the issue of diversity in all these sectors just come into play. So it's kind of like the same person teaching you. And if you aren't, if you aren't that person that they were a few years back, you you aren't going to succeed by their metric. So you aren't going to succeed by the metric of the department. And, and I think that that can, you know, for, for students who do fit that criteria, it's amazing. Like, they become amazing engineers. But if you don't, I think it's a very painful process to have to, because we put a lot of effort, you know, into our studies and whatnot. And if it doesn't feel like it's being, um, validated again and again by every class, every semester, every year. It's like, what kinds of engineers are you producing? What kinds of STEM people? Thank you guys for sharing. So um, okay, we're out of time, so you're all free to go back to your 10 a.m. selves. And <laughs> <sit down. laughs>